praise him, praise him. Then the invocation will follow by our speaker. The collection of tithes and offerings will follow, but before that there will be a, a promotion, reading for the tithes and offerings by Brother Vargas. Then the doxology will be sung by the congregation, O Bless the Gifts. Then the offertory prayer by Brother Norbert Vargas. After the collection of the receiving of tithes and offerings, the story are, and then the scripture reading by Brother Ronel Alden Fernando. The call to prayer will follow as we will be singing, Heavenly Father, to thee we pray. Then the pastoral prayer and the response by the congregation, we will be singing, Almighty Father. After that, we will be hearing a special music by Sister Dayan Texon. Then the message will follow by our speaker. I'm going to read something about our speaker today. I got this from a website, www.andrewmichel.com. And this description was actually a description of a book which is found in our library entitled Convicted. And the description of that book is also a description of the story of this young man. I read, he was a juvenile delinquent, an angry kid with no reason to play by the rules. His mission in life was to wreak havoc anywhere and anytime he could. His parents were afraid of him and his teachers hated him. Other than smoking marijuana, his favorite pastime was theft. Every once in a while, he spent a night in the local detention center. Then, on Halloween night, he got caught driving a getaway car loaded with cuss, drugs, and guns. But this time, he wasn't getting off with a slap on the wrist. Seven counts of kidnapping, two burglaries, and three armed robberies guaranteed this 16-year-old Andrew Michel a 13-year imprisonment behind bars of course what a story what an experience the rest of the story you can read that in the book entitled convicted and some of the description are seen on the website as well again at www.andrewmichel.com but the simple fact that he was that he will be speaking to us today is a testimony of a changed life. And what a powerful testimony indeed. Praise God. Also, some stops in the website was a video clip of his interview in Costa Rica TV and another clip on Mission TV of him explaining the dangers of giving God only 99% of our lives. So, we can assess through this description that we will be having an interesting person to be our speaker this morning. And I pray that we will be praying for him as well as for all of us so that we will be blessed by the messages that we will be hearing today. After the message, we will be singing our hymn of consecration, which is found in hymn number 272, Give Me the Bible. Then the closing prayer will be said by the speaker. The song of hope will follow. This is the triple truth. And we will be singing the, we will be hearing the postload after that. Our, your presider this morning is Brother Dale Claveria. Your song leader is Sister Sandra Canerecio. And our pianist is Brother Ilvin Texon. 
To set our minds farther to our worship this morning, I'm going to read to you a portion of a very wonderful chapter in the Old Testament found in Isaiah 58. I'm reading from verses 13 through 14. Isaiah 58, 13 through 14. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. May God bless us this morning as we worship in spirit and in truth.
pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning. We thank you so much for bringing all of us safely through this week. And now, Heavenly Father, as you have granted us this freedom and this opportunity to come together and worship you, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit into this place, that our hearts may be open to your word, that our minds may be open and attentive to your word, and that we may be able to worship you in the beauty of holiness. This is not something that we can do by ourselves. We need your Holy Spirit. We invite him now. In the wonderful and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before our deacons will serve us, I shall be reading from the Stite and Offering, Offerings Reading 2014. The title is Church Budget Celebrating His Church. This is God's church. He founded it upon himself. Hell may rail against the church, but it will never prevail against it. However, if as a church we hide the message of salvation behind the doors of the church, then ostensibly the gates of hell have prevailed momentarily against the church. Open the doors of the church, get the message out, kick down the gates of hell, and take territory to Christ. Ellen White declares, the church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treachery to him who has bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. In every age, the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which believe. These sentinels gave the message of warning, and when they were called to lay off their armor, others took up the work. God brought these witnesses into covenant relationship with him, uniting the church on earth with the church in heaven, uniting uh, he has sent forth his angels to minister to his church, and the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against his people. Acts of Apostles, page 11. Our appeal this morning, may our faithfulness today find favor with God and the future faithful ones. Our prayer, my all in response to God, God's all. Our deacons are now ready to serve us.
please stand. Gracious Father in heaven, we are happy this morning for gathering us together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you also for this opportunity of worshiping you through our tithes and our offerings. Bless this amount, O oh Lord, as this money will continue to be an instrument of spreading the gospel of salvation for the hastening of your coming. And it is our desire that when your work will be finished and done, all of us will have the opportunity of staying and living with you in that heavenly home that you have prepared together with our loved ones. Thank you for answering our prayers and for forgiving all our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Inviting the children to come for your story art. Uncle Adabiloa will give you this story. Good morning, beautiful girls and handsome boys. Are you ready to listen to a story this morning? How about you? Are you ready too? Okay, yes, of course, because today is God's holy day. My story this morning is about Love is a reason. One day, a little boy named Tini felt so alone. There was no one in sight to play with. Then, he heard Greg, who lived across the street, calling. Hi, come over and play. Then, Timmy Look up and down the street. Then he looked back. He looked back to see if mother was watching. He knew he was not supposed to cross the street without an older person with him. But since mother was not around to help him, and since there was no traffic in sight, then Timmy dashed across the street to play with his friend. Let us play cowboys first, Greg suggested. Then the two boys were galloping. Yeah, tigidig, 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 tigidig. Yeah, tigidig, tigidig, tigidig. Yeah, tigidig, 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 tigidig. Walloping and shouting. After they tired of that game, 
Jimmy said, let's play that we are sellers. So the two boys climbed up on the tree and pretended that they are selling a big ship. Drop the anchor, drop the anchor, drop the anchor. Then they played ball, and after that, they flew Greg's kite. Suddenly, Timmy heard mother calling. I have to go now, Timmy said. Come back this afternoon so that we could play our tracks, Greg replied. I would, uh, I would probably be sitting in my room this afternoon. I was not allowed to cross the street without an older person with me. Timmy crumpled. Oh, it was my fault that I told you to come over and play. Greg said slowly. I knew better, but there was no one to play with. I always have so much fun with you. Timmy muttered. Just then, mother crossed the street, took Timmy by the hand and smiled at Greg. Timmy was not able to play with you this afternoon, mother said. Timmy, please go to your room and think about what you have done. You don't love me or you don't want me to get to have fun. Timmy went inside his room, but he did not spend much time about the rule he had broken. She does not love me. She does not even care if I have fun or not. It was not so long before mother came to Timmy's room. You may now go out and play now, but stay in your room yard. So Timmy put on his jacket and ran to the back porch to get to get his cut muffin. So Timmy's and then as they played Timmy's son forgot how angry he has been. He watched while Muffin played a ball of yarn and he waited while Muffin climbed up in the tree. He waited and waited and waited. But Muffin did not came down in the tree. He looked up in the tree, but he could not see Muffin anywhere. All at once, he saw a white streak for chasing the birds out in the yard. The birds flew across the street and Muffin was right behind them. Muffin, you came down in the other side of the tree. Come back! Timmy yelled. But Muffin kept on running. There was a car moving. Timmy does not know what to do. So he closed his eyes and thought. Suddenly, he ran in the side of the street and called Muffin once more. Muffin, turn! Crutch her back and rub against his legs. Then Timmy took her hand and cuddled in his arms. When they started up the walk, Timmy saw his mother standing at the front. When they started and then he saw his mother. Don't you think Muffin will feel that you don't love her if you scold her? Mother asked. If I don't scold her, Mom, he, this time, she may do it again. I don't know. I don't want my Muffin to get hurt. I love her, Timmy said. And then he smiled. Aha! I realize now. You punish me because you love me, right? Yes, mother said. 
because mama and papa loves you. We do not we don't want you to do things which will harm you. So, Timmy said, from now on, I will wait until you can take me across the street. And that's the end of my story this morning. You may now go to your moms and dads. The center of our study this morning is found in the book of Psalms. And let me invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 97. 119, verse 97. I am reading from the King James Version. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Again. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. May these words be the sentiment and the prayer of our hearts as we daily live in Christ. I'm inviting the congregation to kneel for a prayer. Heavenly Father, we call you Father because you are indeed our Father. You were our Creator, and you are our Redeemer. And you have given us this Sabbath to remind us again that without you, we are nothing. This moment, dear Lord, I bring to you our request. You know that some of us have come here and gathered for worship with great joy, ready to adore you and praise you for the wondrous things that you have done. But there are also those who have come here with tears and burdens in our hearts. You, O oh God, who inhabits the praises of your people, you have made known unto us that you do not only live in high and holy place, but also in the hearts of the lowly and those that are contrite. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And so this morning, dear Lord, we are assured that you are with us. I pray, dear Lord, that as we continue worshiping you, because you are worthy of our praise and adoration and worship. May your spirit will continue to work in our hearts to make us ready to receive your words and to enable us to do your will that you will be giving us this morning. So I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us be attentive to the words that will be spoken by our speaker. May you stand by Andrew's side 
and teach him the words to speak so that all of us will be blessed. We will be edified and you will be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. And thank you for cleansing us from all unrighteousness that we will be worthy to receive the blessings that you have intended for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Maayong adlang ipapahulay satanan. My wife, my very beautiful wife, is Bisaya, and she's teaching me Bisaya very slowly, so I'm learning. Please don't laugh at me. Um, as I was introduced this morning, uh, for the last five years, I have been a volunteer missionary in the country of Thailand. And after getting married, we went to the country of Kenya for the last four or five months, and we just recently came back to the Philippines. Um, and so my wife is not here this week. She just left me this week. I'll explain why in a minute. But she's going to Manila. So I will be in the Philippines for probably the next four years. So I need to learn Visaya and Tagalog. And my Tagalog isn't much better. All I can say is this. Gusto kong matutong magsalita ng Tagalog. Pero masyadong maganda ang aking guro. Hindi ko maalala natutunan. That's all I know. Uh, it's a joy to be back here with everyone at MVC. Uh, I, I, I want to share a story in a minute why my wife is gone. Uh, but this morning I will be talking about the, the importance of the law, the value of the law, why the law is so wonderful. Why did the psalmist write, Oh, how I love the law. It is my meditation all the day. Before I begin, can we bow in a word of prayer and ask God to bless this message? Father God in heaven, again, it is a joy and a pleasure and a privilege to come together to worship you on this morning. We ask again, Lord, send your Holy Spirit here that our hearts may be warmed, that our minds may be open to your word, that your people this morning will be thinking people. And as they read the text in the Bible, the Bible will speak to them. We ask you, Lord, to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by asking a question, would you ever compromise the law so that you can succeed? Would, if you have, to, in the future, when you leave this school and you have to decide between success and obedience, will you compromise God's law? I ask that for a reason because my wife graduated from here at MVC in a nursing program she finished medical school. Now she's come back to apply as a doctor in several hospitals. And my wife has been going to different hospitals applying for residency. She meets all the qualifications. She meets all the, all the criteria except for one. All the doctors at the interviews told her, we want you to work at our hospital, but all the doctors here have to take exams on the Sabbath. And you have to go to lectures and conferences on the Sabbath. You have to do that. All the doctors have to do that. My wife said, I'm sorry. We love Jesus and Jesus loves the Sabbath. So I can't compromise on the Sabbath. So my wife has been applying to different hospitals. At one of the hospitals, actually here in Mindanao, my wife was applying. There was another doctor there who was a, a fellow student with her going to medical school. And she really wanted my wife to, to stay there and work with her. She was not Adventist. And my wife told, my wife applied there, same response. You're going to have to do all these activities on the Sabbath. And the friend said to my wife, please come and work here. Please work at this hospital. And my wife said, I'm, I'm sorry, but Jesus loves the Sabbath. And we want, to, we want to keep this time with God every week. We're not going to compromise the Sabbath. And the friend said this, why not? There's another Seventh-day Adventist doctor here, and they don't keep the Sabbath. They do everything on the Sabbath. Uh-oh, what happened to the witness? When I heard this, I was, very, I was very pained. I was very grieved. And the reason is this, is because here's a person that does not read the Bible, doesn't love God, and they're getting a confusing message. Their mind is confused. Do these people love the Sabbath? Or do they not love the Sabbath? And I was so pained, I thought, God must intervene. God has to do something so that this person is not confused. God, please do something. And there is something all throughout the Bible that everyone in the Bible, when they are desperate for God to work in their life, they spend time doing something. 
They spend time in fasting and prayer. So here, last week, on Wednesday, I did not eat anything, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, only some water. Thursday, I did not eat anything at all, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, only water. And Friday, the same thing. I did not eat anything. I fasted and prayed for three days. Here. Sabbath came. We had church service. We went back to Dr. Talibong's house. And we were eating potluck. And in the house, uh, Dr. Talibong was there. Um, who else was there? Dr. Caballero, Dr. Michelle, so a lot of students. Some of you here this morning were there in, in the house as we were eating potluck. And as we were eating potluck, my wife's phone rang. She picked up the phone And this was the summary of the conversation. We are the doctors at the public hospital where you came and applied. We recognize that you are not going to compromise the Sabbath. But we want you to work here so much, we are going to make an exception for you. All of the doctors have to do these activities on the Sabbath. But as long as you work at our hospital, you don't need to do that. You can go to the lectures, you can get notes from the conferences, and we will give you your exams a different day of the week. If you want to do that, you can start work in two days, on Tuesday. So praise God, a direct answer to prayer. Not something weeks, months, years ago. This just happened here at NBC just one week ago. So that's why my wife is not here. God answered a prayer and allowed her to get a job Uh, The same day, I got asked to stay and give this sermon. So I wanted to stay just to encourage you, and I thought it was that important that God does answer prayer. But sometimes he doesn't always answer just prayer. There are times in our life when we just set aside special time to meditate on the Word and spend time in prayer and not eat maybe a day or two, but God will answer. Um, and, And the reason why I wanted to pray that prayer is because I believe I felt what the psalmist felt when the psalmist wrote in the Bible, Psalm 119, 97, oh, how I love the law. I love the law. It's my meditation day and night. In order to illustrate why the law is so wonderful and important, I want to share a story this morning. In May 26th, 2013. This just happened last year. Around 4 o'clock in the morning off the coast of Nigeria in the Atlantic Ocean, there was a tugboat. The name of the tugboat was the Jaskin 4, which you can see here in this picture. And that tugboat was pulling a massive oil tanker. Well, there was a crew of 12 people on that boat. Because of pirates, they locked themselves in their rooms at night so that the pirates couldn't get to them. At four o'clock in the morning, a massive wave came and turned over the boat. The cables connecting it to the taker snapped. The boat then turned over, brought on water, and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Twelve people, no survivors. Well, they put out a call. The tanker probably puts out a distress call And they called for a team of deep sea divers to come to the scene, to dive to the bottom of the ocean, and to retrieve the dead bodies. Now, how would you like that? What a grisly task. So the divers, they get the call. They don't arrive until three days later. The divers arrive on the scene. They put on their special gear. They put on their special suit. They get... They get their air hose, they walk to the edge of the boat and jump off and dive down to the bottom of the ocean. Now, can you imagine? It's very dark, it's very cold, there's all sorts of pressures. And as they're diving down, they find the boat and they begin to search around the boat. Now, can you do something for me? Could you take your right hand, lift up your right hand and then grab, just act like you're grabbing something. Now, imagine this, the divers are down there and they find dead bodies. They reach out, they grab the dead body, and they pull it out and take it to the surface. What a grisly, horrible task. Well, they had gone down to the bottom and by that time they had collected four dead bodies. They went down again. The diver is swimming through the dark water. It's very cloudy. 
It's very difficult to see. He's got a light on his helmet, so he can only see a little bit in front of him. And he's got a camera. And so this was recorded, and you can see the actual video on YouTube later on. Well, he's going through the water, and as he turns a corner in the part of the boat at about 5 minutes and 30 seconds into the video, he turns and sees something in the water. I don't know if you can see this on this picture. He turns and looks, and it's a hand floating in the water. Isn't that gross? You can hear there's a microphone from him to the boat. You can hear the people on the boat go, oh, there's another one. There's another dead body. The diver reaches out and grabs the hand. And the hand grabs him back. The hand grabs him back. He begins shouting, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. You can hear the people on the microphone, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And so the diver grabs the hand and the hand grabs him and he's just shaking and he swims, he swims closer and he comes up to the surface. He comes up, he breaks the surface and he sees a man at the bottom of the ocean. This man was a cook on the boat. At around four in the morning, he woke up, he had to go to the bathroom. He went to the bathroom, that's when the wave hit, the boat sank, and he was caught in a part of the boat that created an air pocket, okay? So the man you're looking at, his name is Harrison, Harrison Okene. He is a cook from Nigeria working on the boat, and he has been at the bottom of the ocean for the last three days. They did the calculation on the air that he had to breathe. They calculated that he had about two and a half or three days to live with that air. So he was on his last few hours of his life and a diver came out of the darkness and found him alive. True story, you can watch the video online if you want to. Now, I want you to think about something. Could you imagine if that was you in the water? Can you imagine what that would feel like you're sitting in this freezing cold water. It's salt water. Harrison said that after a few days, his skin began to peel off from sitting in the salt water for a few days. It's totally black. He can't see anything. There's no light. There's no food. There's no water. He can't sleep. It's hard to breathe. His air is running out. The only thing that he can smell are the smells coming from his dead friends of dying bodies. Now think about the sounds. He can't hear anything. There's only one sound that Harrison heard during those three days. It was the sound of animal creatures in the deep eating the bodies of his dead friends. How grisly, how horrible. And he's down there thinking, I'm never going to see my wife again. I'm never going to see my family. I'm at the bottom of the ocean. There's no hope for me. This is where I'm going to die. But when the diver swims up to him, it's just a fantastic audio. The diver swims up to him, breaks the surface. He brings another helmet. He brings a suit for him and some gear and some water. And he starts talking to Harrison. And the first thing that he says to Harrison is, Hey, you're a survivor. Cheer up, man. Thumbs up. You're going to make it. I have come down to you. We're going to save you. We're going to take you out of here and take you back to the surface. It's okay. Cheer up. Don't worry anymore. And he begins to just give him all this good news. And you can imagine he's so happy. Listen to this. He is so happy to give him instructions. A savior has come down to save him. He's giving him instructions and he's so happy to give them. And the man, he's so happy to receive them. Think about this. Just as the divers responded to a call for help, Jesus has responded to a lost world. Just as the divers left the security of their boat, Jesus has left the security of heaven. Just as the divers put on special suits and equipment, so Jesus clothed his divinity with humanity. Just as the diver encouraged the survivor, so Jesus has brought good news. Cheer up, you sinners. And just as the diver gave instructions to the survivor, so Jesus has also given us instructions. Think about this for a moment. When Harrison, who you can see on the screen, 
when he's being saved and the diver or his savior gives him instructions, gives him commandments like calm down, relax, put on this special suit that I have for you, put on this helmet, hold on to the umbilical cord, which is your airline and your communication. Don't let go of the umbilical cord. When Harrison is given the commandments, when he's given the instructions, do you think that Harrison responds, oh man, I can't do that. Those are too difficult. Those are too hard. Oh, they, they, they take away all the fun. I don't want these commands. I can't do that. No, Harrison responds with joy. He says, get, he responds, he's so happy. He wants the instructions so that he can live, so that he can be saved. He wants the instructions and commandments so that he can be lived and rescued out of that darkness. This is the exact same language and attitude that we find in Psalm 119. You have your Bible with you. Open with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Say amen when you are there. Okay, Psalm 119. You'll notice, first of all, that Psalm 119 is the longest verse, is the longest psalm in all the psalms. It's also the longest chapter in the whole Bible, and there is a reason for that. You'll notice that there are 176 verses. Now, in your Bibles, most Bibles will show this, in the beginning of every eight verses, there is a word. Like in the beginning, it says Aleph, and the next word says Bet. These are Hebrew letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And you'll notice that for every letter, there are eight verses. Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem. It's a poem that has every verse begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's like, for example, writing a poem and the letter A. Eight verses, A, 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 A. The next eight verses, the letter B. B, 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 and so on and so forth. Since there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, you multiply that by 8, you have 176 verses. So that's why there are 176 verses here. You'll notice in verse 1, verse 1 highlights what the psalmist is going to talk about in this psalm. Uh, if you are in the King James or the New King James, it will say blessed. Many other versions will say happy. I'm reading from the CSB. It says, verse 1, How happy are those whose way is blameless, who live according to the law of the Lord. Uh, you all also notice in verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. As you've probably read Psalm 119 before, through all 176 verses, over and over and over again, he says, Oh, I love the law. It's my delight. I delight in the law. I'm so glad to have the law. He says, your law, your commandments, your word, it's better, it's sweeter than honey. It's better than even fine gold. He, all Psalm 119 is about the magnification and the honoring of this wonderful law that God has given. And the fact that it is the longest chapter or psalm in the whole Bible, I think, deserves our attention. He says some things in there. You may be wondering, why is the psalmist so glad to have the law? Why is he so happy about this? We don't know exactly who the author is. The Bible doesn't say. But textual evidence suggests that this was David who wrote this psalm. It's similar to his style and his life experience is reflected in a lot of these, a lot of these verses. You'll notice that he is so happy because he begins to share what the law has done for him. He begins to share the benefits, the benefits, the benefits that he gets from the law. For example, uh, there are many benefits he talks about. I will just cover a few of them. In verse number one, he says, how happy I am. How happy are those whose way is blameless who live according to the law of the Lord. Some other verses say uh, that the, another benefit is freedom. The law gives freedom. 
the law revives people in verse 28. If you look at verse 28, in this version it says, I am weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. The law of God, the word of God strengthens people when they are, when they are sick or when they are weak. It keeps people safe. It gives people hope. It gives comfort. He continues to elaborate on all these different benefits. He says the law gives life. The, the law is a source of joy and the source of peace. Is there anyone in here? You want more peace? You want more joy? I highly recommend finding it the same place that the psalmist found it. You'll notice in verse 74. Look at verse 74. It says... Those who fear you will see me and rejoice, for I put my hope in your word. This is so wonderful because by keeping the law, by keeping God's word, we live our lives in a manner that causes other people to look and see and rejoice. When you live your life in accordance with God's law and God's word, you live your life in a manner that causes other people to rejoice. You become a source of motivation to other people. Uh, just one more benefit here. Let's look at verses 98 to 100. 98 to 100. The psalmist says, Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, because your decrees are my meditation." Verse 100, I understand more than the elders because I obey your precepts. He says that by reading the word of God, knowing God's law, knowing God's commandments, it makes him smarter than his enemies, wiser than his teachers. Students, pay attention. Wiser than their teachers and wiser even than the elders. It has so many, there are so many benefits. Those are not all, but I'll stop there. There are so many benefits that he talks about these. And in the midst of 176 verses, this beautiful poem, right there in the middle, in the context of all that the law can do for him, he says, verse 97, Oh, how I love the law. It is, your, it is my meditation all the day long. The only appropriate response seeing what the Bible and the, God's law has done for him is to say, oh, how I love the law. I like what the King James says in verse 167. In verse 167, the King James says, my soul keeps your testimonies and I love them exceedingly. There is, I love them exceedingly. He loves the law so much. When I think about this story of Harrison down there at the bottom of the ocean, I think that this is such a wonderful example that teaches us so much about the role of the law and how wonderful the law is to us. Here's, here, there are several lessons. Let me just talk about a few of them. Lesson number one, the diver comes down the diver can save. The diver wants to save. The diver will save. Only the diver can save the man. But the diver, the savior, gives instructions to Harrison. He gives instructions to the lost person. Why? So that the instructions keep the man close to the savior. Are you following with me? The law cannot save Harrison. He's lost. He's going to die. Only the diver who has come down can save Harrison. But he gives him instructions so that Harrison can stay close to him. Do you think that's important? Isaiah, I think there's a wonderful verse that illustrates this. Isaiah, keep your finger in Psalm 119. We'll go back. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 We'll read from verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. It says, Indeed, the Lord's hand is not too short to save. His ear is not too deaf to hear. Notice verse 2. But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, 
and your sins have hidden him, hidden his face from you. This says barriers. Other versions say it has separated you. Not following the law, not following God's word creates a separation. It blocks you. It cuts you off from God. That's what disobedience does. But Harrison, the lost person, if he follows the law, it keeps him close to the Savior. It won't get him to the service. It just gets him close to the Savior who will take him to the service, to the surface. Number two, lesson number two, keeping the law does not make any sense whatsoever unless you are being saved. Did you follow that? Keeping the law makes no sense unless we are being saved. The idea that the law is done away with doesn't make any sense. It's illogical. It's not true because it is when we are saved that keeping the law has the greatest significance and meaning and effect upon our lives. It is when we have a relationship with Jesus that keeping the law is the most necessary. I think of the words that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Do not think that I came to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I think of Romans chapter 3, verse, I think it's 31. Do we then make void the law? Do we throw the law out through faith? He said, no, God forbid. It is by faith that we establish the law. These wonderful principles. Another lesson. When the diver goes down and he dives down to Harrison, he begins to give him instructions. Put on the helmet, breathe deeply, talk to the voice in your head because he's connected to the surface. Listen to my commands. The diver is keeping the same commands that he's giving to him. Did you follow that? The Savior himself is keeping the law and he serves as a wonderful example to the man so that he also can keep the law. The diver cannot keep the law for him. He has to come close to Jesus and be assisted by Jesus to keep that wonderful law. Another wonderful lesson in verse, in chapter four, if you, in lesson, lesson four, if you turn back to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, and you look at verse 118, Psalm 119, verse 118. It says, verse 118, you reject, speaking about God, you reject all of those who stray from your statutes, for their deceit is a lie. Some of your versions will say, you reject those. You, you, in the King James says, you are trotting down upon those who turn away from their law because their deceit is a lie. This is, I think this is such wonderful news because he is writing the psalm as someone who's receiving so many benefits. And he recognizes that unless I am fully in God's word, committed my life 100%, turning just a little bit, even 99%, I'm going to lose these benefits. I'm going to lose all that God has for me. The final wonderful lesson is uh, in the story, when you watch the video, the divers tell him, you need to grab on to the umbilical. The, who knows what an umbilical is here? An umbilical is the same word that's used to describe the connection between a baby and the mother when the baby is in the womb, that's what keeps the baby alive, the umbilical cord. Harrison, he has, to, he has to hold on to the umbilical his entire way to the surface. He cannot let go. He needs to have a constant communication and connection to the above. The beginning of the verse that we read this morning, Psalm 119, 97 says, Oh, how I love the law. It is my meditation all the day. I love the law. I meditate it all the time. I love the law because I'm living my life where the law is guiding me in all of my decisions. This is so wonderful. Um, this morning when I was introduced by Dale, he explained a little bit how when I was a young man, I was using drugs and I was participating in crimes. And at the age of 16, I got arrested for seven kidnappings and armed robberies. 
The judge said, I don't care if you're just a kid. You want to act like an adult. I'm going to send you to the adult prison. So he sent me to the adult prison for 13 years. As some of you have already heard this story, it was there in prison that someone gave me a Bible. A prisoner gave me a Bible, and a few years later, my mom sent me a better version to read. And as I began to read the Bible, it was the Bible that changed my life. I could not change myself. I was too weak. But you'll remember one of the benefits that we just read in Psalm 119 is that God's Word can strengthen those who are weak. And as the years went by, I continued to read from the Bible every single day. I began to experience what the psalmist said. Oh, how I love the law. It is my meditation all the day long. I was broken. I was lost. I was a high school dropout drug addict felon. But God has provided so many opportunities all these years to do service, to help other people. And all because of spending time in God's word every day. The Bible says in Psalm 119 that the law gives us the benefits of hope. You want more hope? That the law gives you peace. It says great peace have those who love your law. It grants you safety. It gives you wisdom. Do you want more wisdom? I do. Do you want these benefits in your life? Do you want in your life what the psalmist was getting in his life? I want those benefits. The Bible says in Psalm 119 that God is near to us when we keep the law. Remember, not keeping the law creates a division. I don't know about you, but I want to be as near to God as possible. That's why I keep the Bible open every day. Do you want to do that in your life? The Bible says in Psalm 119 that the benefits can only come when we are meditating on God's word every day. Psalm chapter 1, it describes a very happy man who is so fruitful and he meditates in the law and word of God day and night. Don't you want to spend time every day of your life meditating on something that was going to give something back to you that's so beneficial, so invaluable, and you cannot get it anywhere else? Reading the Bible every day and meditating on these wonderful principles has been an enormous benefit in my life. It has been an enormous benefit in the psalmist's life. And I want it to be an enormous benefit in your life as well. Do you want that also? Will you close it? Can we close now in a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your law, for your commandments. You did not give these to us to constrict us, to bind us, to be a heavy burden. No, like for Harrison, the law was part of the role of salvation. We remember Revelation 14, 12. God, you will have a people in this world who have faith in Jesus and they keep the commandments to honor that faith. Lord, I pray that everyone here this morning will begin to love the law and understand the law and perceive the benefits of giving their life to God 100%. Lord, you have done that in my life, and I pray you will do that in the lives of everyone here this morning. We ask it in the name of that great diver, that great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us pray and receive the blessing from the Lord. May God be gracious to us and bless us. Look on us with favor so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. In Jesus' name, amen. We praise God for the message this morning. We're inviting our visitors to join in the potluck. The AY program this afternoon will start at 2 o'clock. Sponsored, uh, sponsored by the cafeteria department. And so we'd like to invite everyone to come here uh, for the AY program that will start at 2 o'clock. Thank you all and see you at the AY. God bless. Happy Sabbath to you all.